you all welcome and very happy to share this fascinating session for those of you watching online i can tell you the room is packed it is really completely full um, no just kidding we have still a few places left so i urge all of you to come to hall d um, so we have a very special session education session today it's called the International Conference of Human Genetics 2023, Genetics Coming Home. And this is a session specially dedicated to a conference which will be organized in 255 days from February 22 to 26 in Cape Town. And um, we very much look forward to seeing all of you there. Um, but this is really as a bit of a teaser we have invited two fantastic speakers uh, to talk about their research, but also the very much the importance of genome evolution and genetic diversity in genomic medicine. So first up is Professor Michelle Ramsey. She's a professor in human genetics at the National Health Laboratory Service in South Africa and director of the Sydney Brenner Institute of Molecular Bioscience at the University of Witwatersrand. She's a past president of the African Society of Human Genetics, and she is, importantly, the chair of the scientific program committee of the International Conference of Human Genetics. She studies single gene disorders, epigenetics, obesity, hypertension, and lots more, and she will talk today to us about evolutionary genomics in Africa. Michelle, the floor is yours. And for all of you, we will do um, questions after both presentations. So if you have questions, you can, for those online, they can put them in the question box. And for all of you here, you can uh, keep your questions for the end of the session. Okay? Thank you very much. Michelle, go ahead. Thank you very much, Joris, for that kind introduction. I have to say it's such a pleasure to be here in person in Vienna. And we are so looking forward to welcoming you home to Africa next year when we have our International Congress of Human Genetics. Um, so Joris has asked me to speak a little bit about evolutionary genetics in Africa and Chance and I had a chance to talk about this last week when we met in Abuja. So we're hoping that our two presentations will be complementary and that you will, will get something out of both of them. So um, I have no conflict of interest to declare and uh, because this is an educational session I've decided to just make five main points during my talk. And the first one is to really talk about our understanding of the evolution of anatomically modern humans in Africa. And then to talk about how this deep evolutionary history has shaped genetic diversity on the continent and in the world. And then to talk about some of the special um, issues about the architecture of African genomes, followed by some examples from work in our laboratory. And then just to end off with some key messages. So archaeologists and human geneticists agree now on a multi-regional origin of modern anatomical man about 3,000 years ago in Africa. And in these three schematics, I just want to give you a snapshot of different times during evolution. So on the left, you can see that um, roughly 300 to 500,000 years ago, there were pre-hominids in Africa, and there's some sense that there might have been interactions between them, although we don't really understand this uh, pan-African origin. And more recently, um, 200,000 years ago, we started seeing substructures forming um, in the African continent, and a splitting off of um, these ancient hun hunter-gatherers, and seeing sort of different things happening in different parts of the continent. And more recently, divergence in specific geographic regions, um, separating different hunter-gatherer groups, both in West and East Africa, but also in Southern Africa. So lots was happening on the continent a very long time ago that shaped our species today. So we have some information from ancient genomes, and that is what's shown in the left uh, box here. So not a lot. In, in Africa, ancient genomes are when we talk about 400 to 8,000 years ago, because the conditions on the African continent were not really conducive to preserving DNA. But we do get very interesting information about the spread of hunter-gatherers across the entire 
continent a long time ago, but we also see some signatures of a phantom population that hasn't made it through to our present day time, but is showing its genes in different populations, especially here in West Africa. In the middle box, I'm just showing you something that started happening about 45,000 years ago, which was the Bantu migration, which has now populated much, much of present day Africa. And what we see are these um, parental Bantu populations from West Africa over here, making their way south and then east and further south on the continent. And as they went along, they admixed with populations that were already resident there, the Khoisan populations and the other hunter-gatherer populations. And that, of course, has shaped the genomes that we see today. But in historical times, 300, 500 years ago, what we can see is that um, between the 16th and 18th centuries, we had a major transatlantic slave trade where about 12 million Africans from predominantly West Africa um, were moved to the Americas. And of course, that is um, much at the basis of our current day African Americans and Caribbean um, African ancestry populations. But there were also other slave trades that were occurring, exodus from Africa, creating this enormous African diaspora, but also then back migration into Africa, certainly in colonial times from Europe, but also from East Asia. So what we see today in Africa are four major ethnolinguistic or four major language groups. And you can see how they spread ac across the continent. And when we think about sub-Saharan Africa, that is primarily populated by Nilo Saharan speakers, uh, not by Nilo Saharan speakers, but by Niger Kazafenian speakers, which is the yellows here. Um, not, not a large population of Khoisan, and then also some of the East African languages here. But you can see this tremendous complexity of migration across the continent. And what we know now um, is really driven by technology and how that has been developed and what capability this technology has brought to us in terms of insights. So if we think in the late 1980s, when we started doing manual sequencing, the first thing that people did was use mitochondrial DNA to look at origins of humans. And that was really the mitochondrial Eve um, hypothesis that came up then. Um, with Southern Blot, we started looking at Y chromosome markers, at microsatellite markers, and the picture deepens until we started doing automated sequencing, could do short sequencing reads, and could look a lot more deeply at the autosomal regions of the, of the genome and try and build up stories and histories. And of course, now we have, through long-range sequencing, our first telomere to telomere um, genome, but it's only one genome, and we need some from Africa. But of course, as technology has developed, our insights have deepened. So what is the impact of this genetic diversity um, on what we see today? So when we look at the phylogenetic analysis here, we can see very much the same picture that I sketched for you before. This origin about 3,000 years ago of modern anatomical humans, then the very deep split between the Khoisan and the other African populations. And what we can see from this particular phylogenetic tree is that there is huge diversity across Africa. So we have to remember that Africa is a very complex continent and you can't extrapolate from one area to another. You really need to understand the deep history. And of course, when we then look at the bottleneck that um, happened when there was migration out of Africa, um, it only took a small proportion of the genetic diversity with it. So there's still many uncertainties and huge complexity in terms of what we understand about the development of modern man in Africa. And we have to understand that our theories are based on assumptions that we put into our models, but also that we're restricted by the data that is available to us. So we haven't yet studied all the African groups. There's much to be done. But we also have to remember that there are these phantom populations that we can't study because they're not represented in our populations today. So hopefully there will be more finds of ancient uh, genomes on the African continent. And of course we interpret things in the light of our current understanding. So I just want to highlight for you a project that started about 10 years ago, which is the Human Heredity and Health in Africa. This was born out of the African Society of Human Genetics and then funded by the NIH and the Wellcome Trust.
And this was one of the joint projects that we did, which was really to look at the high, look at genetic diversity in Africa by sequencing whole genomes from over 400 different individuals from 50 ethno-linguistic groups on the African continent. So you can see here that we combined this with all publicly available data and had pockets of um, participants from different parts, certainly not saturating the continent. And what we could do with principal component analysis was to look at the relationships between these different populations. So there's certainly a genetic geographic correlate, but what we're beginning to see as we saturate um, our, our studies and our data with more populations is that there are clines. They're not isolated pockets. And I think this is true. Whenever populations are neighboring, they will admix. When there's migration, there will be assimilation. So that's very important. So if we look here on the x-axis, we see that there's a major um, division between the niger cordofanian or Niger-Congo groups and the Nilan saharan speakers. And that is mainly East Africa here. But when we look at the y-axis and you see the continuous spread of populations from West Africa to Central Africa to Southern Africa, you can see in terms of the genetics that neighboring groups have interacted and admixed. And we always say that political boundaries are not good ways of defining populations because often within a country you have multiple groups and certainly between countries they share groups. So some of the surprises we got here was the tremendous diversity in Mali, which is shown in the, in the blue here, but also this extraordinary group from West Africa called the Berom, who um, weren't previously known to be uh, divergent to some extent from the other Western African groups. And as you can see that they're, they're um, tending towards East Africa and going into their deeper um, sort of history, there is some indication that this um, certainly makes sense in terms of history and um, genetics. So, so much to be learned from just looking at um, these different populations at a deep genetic level. So on the right here, you see a population structure plot modeled for 10 ancestral populations. And you can see the homogeneousness here of the Europeans and the tremendous diversity from Western Africa all the way to Southern Africa and then the hunter-gatherer populations. And what you can see is that almost all of them are admixtures of multiple populations. So what we know is that we haven't yet plateaued in terms of our ability to discover novel variants from African populations. And this is a figure from that um, H3 Africa paper that I showed you before. And altogether in these um, just over 400 whole genomes, 40 million variants were identified, approximately 12 to 20 million per population. And what you can see here are the number of novel variants in individuals in different populations, with the Botswanan population showed in the purple here, showing the biggest um, novel discovery. And if you take them as a baseline and you look at all the other groups and you look at the additional novel variants, in millions of variants, you can see that this is no, not close to plateauing, so there's much to be discovered yet. And in the study, 4.3 million novel variants were identified, and many of them were singletons and were restricted to specific populations because, of course, the sample size per population was quite small. So one of the other things we looked at was signatures of selection because there's no question that adaptation to the environment has shaped a lot of the diversity that we see in African populations. And that is, you know, looking at this north-south axis in Africa and knowing that there's tremendous diversity in terms of a diet, in terms of climate, but also in terms of exposure to infectious diseases. So what we found was that there were over 100 genes under strong selection, of which 62 had not previously been identified. And these genes are, invi are involved in viral immunity, DNA repair, reproduction, carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. And of course, when we think about viral selection, those could be things like HIV, Ebola, Lassa fever. And I wonder what COVID is doing to the genomes of people in Africa at the moment. So what we know is that these signatures of selection are different in different populations across the continent. So this is a figure that comes from a review that was published last year that um, shows in each of the columns how different approaches to looking at genome data can highlight different signatures of selection. So either through genome-wide association studies, through admixture mapping, through positive selection scanning, or 
looking at adaptive integration, we see these signatures of selection that have, occur have occurred in peoples across Africa. So some examples, and the best known one is probably selection due to malaria, which is hyperendemic in many regions of West, East, and Central Africa. And of course, the most well-known sickle cell mutation in the beta globin gene that I think Charles will tell you a bit more about later, but also G6PD variants. And then also selection that has occurred as a result of um, sleeping sickness in trypanosomiasis, which has selected for mutations in the APOL1 gene, which we now know produce some susceptibility to kidney disease in African populations and understanding that African populations have about a four to five times higher risk for kidney disease than other populations worldwide. There's also been interesting co-evolution on the African continent between cattle domestication and lactase persistence. Of course, this is not um, restricted to Africa, but also happened in other parts of the world. So if we look at the distribution of lactase persistence across the world, you can see here very common in Europe, but in certain parts of Africa, and that this goes together with the domestication of cattle. But when you look at specific variants, you can see that some of them arose in Europe, whereas others arose in Africa and spread from there. And then there are many examples now of uh, lipid metabolism genes that are important in terms of selection. And many of you will be aware of uh, PCSK9, which um, there was a variant that was identified in African Americans and then shown to be much more common in Africans that is associated with lower lipid levels or a more healthy lipid profile. And that, of course, has now been converted into PCSK9 inhibitors to treat high cholesterol levels. So I want to spend the next couple of minutes talking about unique attributes of African genomes. So the first is that we have increased discovery potential because of the high genetic diversity in African uh, genomes. And to the left here are just three studies showing us the millions of new variants that are identified when we study small numbers of Africans. And this will continue to happen. We also know that there's much higher heterozygosity in African populations compared to European or Asian. And this, of course, gives us much informativeness in terms of looking at disease association. And when we look at absolute number of variants that are different from the reference sequence, in African individuals, it's roughly 5 million, whereas in individuals from the rest of the world, it's roughly um, 4 million. So the other thing that is really important in Africa is the concept of population structure, that this is a very complex um, grid of uh, populations. And first of all, we can look at genetic distances to see the structure. We do phylogenetic analysis, as I showed you before, and we use principal component analysis. And there is a need to adjust for population structure when we do any studies related to health in Africans. But one of the other things that is very important and makes life um, very uh, interesting working in Africa is really our potential to identify causal variants because of the lower linkage disequilibrium in African populations. So on the left here, you can see um, the decay of linkage disequilibrium uh, being much faster in sub-Saharan African populations than in other populations. And also when you look at how this impacts on uh, genome-wide association studies and polygenic risk scores, that there are interesting things that we need to consider and, um, and use this when we think about whether we're powered to identify associations or not. So for example, in the polygenic risk scores here, if you develop the risk score in a European population, how well will it, it explain the variance in an African, East Asian, or European population? And what you can see for these multiple traits is that of course, it will best explain variants in European populations and most poorly in African populations. So this is a European Society of Human Genetics meeting. And you may ask, well, why is it important to study African populations? Well, it is because our species originated in Africa and populated the rest of the world. And whatever we discover in Africa may have application globally, but also, of course, to the African diaspora. So I'm going to give you a couple of, of examples of um, some of the work that we do in our laboratory and some of the work from the literature. I've just chosen four examples because there are, of course, so many to think about. So first of all, um, just 
when we think about the impact of genetics on disease, we have to remember that whether we are healthy or have some disease is really a very complex process, and it's not all to do with the genome. Although they're very interesting um, genetic predispositions, there are also many other things that are important, like the environment, like uh, host factors in terms of lifestyle um, and behavior, and of course we know that the microbiome plays an important role, and we're just beginning to get information on the microbiome in African populations and expect very interesting differences there. So really, we need to understand all these mediators of the phenotype. So I just have um, one slide on monogenic disorders because this is important in terms of transferability of tests that have been developed in um, European populations and their application in Africa. So of course we want to have a situation in Africa where we have a genetic services for diagnosis, for, for prenatal and carrier screening and for newborn screening. And we see a lot of allelic heterogeneity for monogenic disorders in Africa. And here are just some examples. So for cystic fibrosis, the common African mutation is rarely found out of Africa um, and only in Africa diaspora um, populations. So we cannot use the same diagnostic tests. For Gosha disease, there are different alleles that are the dominant alleles in Africa. And the same for BRCA1 mutations. But what we also see in Africa is locus heterogeneity, where we see different genes contributing to the same phenotype or the same disease. So for instance, in Huntington's disease, in European populations, there's a single locus on chromosome four where the triplet expansion causes Huntington's disease. But in Africa, there are two different loci, and about a third of people with the Huntington phenotype have a triplet expansion in a different gene on a different chromosome. So this is very important for people anywhere in the world who's studying uh, populations that come from Africa. The same is true for albinism, great locus heterogeneity, and Fanconi anemia. So there's no question that we need a lot more data from African families in terms of monogenic disorders to make sure that we have appropriate tests um, that will be applicable to them. So I'm going to switch now to complex disease genetic associations and how we think about um, considering the characteristics of African genomes. So first of all, we have to think when we do GWAS analysis that we can't use the same arrays or that if we do, we will lose a lot of information and power because of the linkage disequilibrium differences. So for that purpose, the H3 Africa Consortium has developed their own array which is enriched for common variants in African populations. It's also very important when you do imputation that you consider what your reference genome set is and that it needs to be close to the population which is your target or that your data comes from for you really to have accurate um, imputation. And it's very important to control for population structure because you can end up with a very high false discovery rate if you don't think about um, correcting or adjusting for population structure, very important in African studies. And what is, what is really interesting is looking at replication, because if we use the, genome, the, the GWAS catalog, we know that over 98% of the participants are non-African. So a lot of the associations will not replicate directly, and what we've started noticing is that very often it's a different lead SNP, but still the same locus that is found in an African population. But there's, of course, much potential for novel discovery as well. We also see that when we find associations with the same SNPs, that the effect sizes can be very different. We also need to consider, of course, uh, population background, not only in terms of diversity, because, but also in terms of linkage disequilibrium and how this can affect the ability to, first of all, find associations, but also in terms of replicating those associations. And very importantly, also the issue of gene environment interaction because we know that this may mask certain associations and we're beginning to get data in that area which is really fascinating. So just to sum up again, so um, because of the high genetic diversity in African populations, we have the potential for novel discovery. The population structure, of course, means that we have huge challenges because we also often have sample sizes that are too small or suboptimal. But we know that the lower linkage disequilibrium help us in terms of fine mapping and really pinpointing those causal variants.
So I just want to give you one example of population substructure. And this is a, a study done on 5,000 uh, South African, uh, Southeastern Bantu speakers. And we had always thought that they were fairly homogeneous, that if we did genetic studies in South Africa, if people said they spoke a Southeastern Bantu language, we could put them together and we didn't really need to worry about population structure. Well, we've now shown that this is not true and we have to be very mindful of what is happening. So you see there a map of South Africa and you see the different um, language groups in different colors. And those colors are also matched in the 5,000 participants who are shown in these principal component plots. So in the first one, it's all 5,000 individuals together. And although they're color coded, you can see that there's much overlap um, between what seems to be groups emerging. But if we remove from the sample everybody who's not concordant for grand parental ethnolinguistic group, what we see is that what is left over is much more clearly defined as three different groups. So this has been um, also shown by phylogenetic analysis and we know in part is because there are different degrees of Khoisan admixture in these different groups and that is partly what is segregating them into independent groups. So it's very important in South Africa that when we do case control studies, that we control very carefully for population structure. I'm now going to use another example. Um, let's see, this is, oh no, this is still the same example and it's really showing you just how badly you can inflate your false discovery if you don't control for um, population substructure. So this is a QQ plot on the right and you can see without controlling, you have this massive false positive rate, but when you control for um, ancestry using principal component analysis, you can deal with that quite successfully. And what we also saw in this particular study is that when you look at the different language groups in South Africa, the frequency of specific variants that are well known to be associated with diseases can be very different. So I'm going to use a very recent example that was published earlier this year by Huffman et al, looking at how African ancestry populations can help us pinpoint causal variants, in this case, in a, an association with severe COVID-19. So this particular allele um, is known to be protective. It is a splice variant in the OAS1 gene, and it lowers the risk for severe COVID by about 23%. So um, it's known that the G allele at this locus is protective and that it's much more common in Africans than in Europeans. And what I'm going to show you here is when you look in the European population, what you find associated in this region is a region that is a haplotype block of about 75 kilobases and that has its origins in Neanderthals. When they analyze this, taking into consideration population structure and specifically African ancestry populations, and you redo the analysis, what you can see is a single variant coming up. And, um, and that then showed that this was the causal variant and there's beautiful functional studies really supporting this. And uh, what they postulate is that this particular variant precedes the split between Neanderthal and African populations. But now I want to tell you about a cohort that we've developed um, under the auspices of the H3 Africa Consortium. And this is a cohort that we call ABIGEN. It stands for the Africa BITS, which is our institute, in-depth partnership for genomic research. And you can see that this research has been done over different regions in Africa, west, east, and south. And this has been both a blessing, but also a huge challenge when we do our analyses. So our cohort is about 12,000 individuals, and um, we have collected an enormous amount of data on, of course, the genetics, but also modifiable risk factors and then certain indicators for risk like lipid levels or fasting insulin and uh, glucose levels. So we have a lot of data. So I just want to show you this recently published uh, paper, which is looking at the genetic association for lipid traits across this um, cohort using the four uh, traits, LDL, HDL, total cholesterol, and triglycerides. And this is a, a a two-step analysis. The first step was to look at what we could find in the Abigen study, and the second step was to do meta-analysis with other African, African continental cohorts, and then to look at the associations and look at transferability of associations, and then also at predictability of polygenic risk scores.
So in this Miami plot um, for association with LDL, on the bottom you can see the association in Abigen itself, and at the top, the meta-analysis, which then included about 25,000 individuals. And what you can see is that we replicate many of the known loci associated with LDL, like LDL receptor, APOE, PCSK9, and so on. But we have found um, one novel association, and I'm going to show you a little bit more on that because we're not sure what it means, but it seems extraordinary that you can have European cohorts in the millions that have not detected this association, but you can find it in an African population. And this you know, could be something about a unique gene environment interaction, or, or it could just genuinely be novel in this African population. So um, first of all, to show you how Studying African populations narrows down the 95% critical or credible set. So if you look at the LDL receptor signal for, um, for LDL, you can see in Europeans, the 95% credible set includes about 40 SNPs. When you do that in the African study, um, that goes all the way down to a single SNP. This is the, um, the more detailed information on this novel association, and we really find this very curious. Because when we do the Abigen only analysis, this GAT B locus comes up um, genome wide significant. And you can see there's a very clear lead SNP here, although there's LD with many others. But when you look at the meta analysis, the strongest signal is not in exactly the same position. It's sort of shifted to the left and now is in another gene. So there's no prior evidence of how this is involved in lipid metabolism, but we think this is going to be very interesting to try and unpack further. In this slide, I just want to make the point that allele frequencies differ across South, East, and West Africa, as well as the effect sizes associated with certain SNPs. And just showing the example of two SNPs here, where the orange shows West African populations, the green East and the blue South. So what you can see here is that there are some differences in allele frequencies of this particular variant, um, but that the effect sizes are very similar. Whereas with this other variant, more similar allele frequency across the populations, but the effect sizes differ greatly um, across West, East, and Southern Africa. So we have to be very careful in terms of how we interpret results um, working with African populations. This is now looking at um, transferability of polygenic risk scores. And I think we have to be very careful about generalizing and know that for different phenotypes, you can have different effects. And so here we have LDL triglycerides, uh, total cholesterol triglycerides and HDL. And when we look at the polygenic risk scores developed in the blue, which is an African ancestry population, in the orange, a multi-ethnic, and in the yellow, a European, if you look at um, all of these traits, you can see that the percentage of the variability explained is always lowest when it's only European populations in the discovery population. And it can be higher when it's multi-ethnic or when it's African. But what you can see when we look at the deciles of the polygenic risk scores is that, is that there are huge differences between different phenotypes. So I just want to sh highlight one study in terms of gene environment interactions. And this is particularly looking at genetic variation and smoking in the context of carotid intermamedia thickness. And that, of course, is a marker for atherosclerosis. And in the Abigen study, we decided to restrict this analysis to West Africa, but also to men, because culturally women generally in West Africa are less likely to smoke and less than 1% of our West African cohort women uh, with smokers. So what we've shown here is that there are some loci like the marker here, which when you stratify your population according to non-smokers and smokers, you can see that the carotid intermamedia thickness um, is higher if you have the TT or one copy of the T allele. So I think finding gene environment interactions are gonna be key to interventions uh, in the future. So um, this is now an example from colleagues of ours looking again at transferability of genetic risk scores when those were derived either from European, African-American, or mixed ancestry cohorts. And this was looking at cohorts in Uganda and in South Africa. 
and all of those differences you're well aware of. And this is now applying polygenic WISC scores from those three different populations to the South African Zulu population, 2,500 individuals. So what you can see is that the percent of variance explained generally is higher for the African populations, less for the mixed ancestry and very low for the European. But again, you can see that there are differences across the different traits with um, you know, your LDL here, your triglycerides here, and then you can see the distribution of the predictive ability um, across um, centiles. But what was really fascinating here was looking at the percent variance explained using the African-American uh, PRS for total cholesterol. And you can see that it is much higher for the Zulu from South Africa than it is for the participants from Uganda. And when we look at the minor allele frequencies between the South African Zulu and the Ugandan population, you can see that they are far from the same, <laughs> so very different. So huge challenges working across Africa. So I just want to end off with a few uh, key messages. And um, first of all, you know, I think I've convinced you all that African populations are fascinating to study and we have so much work to do. Our cohorts are just way too small and we need to increase them. But I think you know, we, we're not near saturating the genetic diversity. Um, not only are there more variants, but there are large differences in allele frequencies. The lower linkage to equilibrium really works to our advantage in terms of um, fine mapping. And what we know is that there is this very complex population structure, which means that if we develop approaches to precision medicine in one region of Africa, it will not necessarily apply to another. And so I think there's, there's much work to be done, much to be understood across different regions. So huge potential for novel discovery um, by studying African genomes. And I think we can say that whatever we do discover in Africa will be relevant to global populations um, because we're all from Africa originally and also to the African diaspora today, which we've seen more and more across the world. And we do know that context matters in so many different ways that um, there is environmental um, diversity that can impact gene uh, associations in a, in a very big way, that we need to consider the genetic background, and um, that we need to increase diversity in genetic studies um, from many parts of Africa, but also wherever we're working, um, because this will help us advance science and gain novel insights. So I think we can say that at the moment, you know, sort of research is done in specific regions in the world, that there's often ethnic exclusion. We know that when people analyze the UK biobank data, they often exclude the African uh, data. They use only the, the, what they call white British. So, you know, we often lose what can be really important and interesting. And there's huge inequity in terms of applying um, whatever we learn. So we're hoping that we will generate more research, more data, especially from understudied populations. And at the moment, we know there isn't affordability or access in most parts of the developing world or develop, yeah, developing world. And what we would like to work towards is more diversity and more inclusion in different populations so that in the future, we have a situation where there is globalization, but also equity, uh, no matter where you originally are from. So I've just put some um, links here for uh, enrichment reading. I know you can't really uh, capture this now, but hopefully online you can see where this is, and specifically to point you to that special issue of human molecular genetics that was published in March last year, and that is a series of you know over 15 papers devoted to evolutionary genetics in Africa. Makes for very interesting reading. And then the review article that I referenced quite a lot, and then also that H3 Africa paper on um, genetic diversity in Africa. And just to end off with inviting you all to come to Cape Town to come home in February next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>